Well, the title of my message today is The Body's Proclaimer. And we're going to be looking at the ministry of the evangelist, whose mandate is to proclaim, declare, and make known the good news of the gospel. My text is taken from Matthew 9, 37 to 38, which reads, Yeshua said to his disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to Yahweh, who is in charge of the harvest, and ask him to send more workers into his field. You know, this is a very famous passage of scripture. You know, it's familiar to most of us here, isn't it? You know, there's, there's the harvest is great, but the workers are few. But just to give this a little bit more context, I'm going to read from two verses earlier from the expanded Bible because I want to bring something out here. Verse 35. Yeshua travelled through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching and proclaiming the good news, the gospel about the kingdom, and healing all kinds of diseases and sicknesses. Here we go. When he saw the crowds, he felt sorry. He had compassion for them because they were hurting. They were distressed, confused, harassed and helpless. Discouraged, dejected, like sheep without a shepherd. And Yeshua said to his disciples, you know, he'd just been healing the sick and delivering people. And he looked and he said, There are many people to harvest. You know, this harvest is great, it's large. But there are only a few workers. The laborers are few. And I believe it's here that we can get some insight into the heart and the mind of Yeshua. You can feel his compassion towards these people. You can feel the heaviness, the weight and the burden of his heart. And his desire for more workers. An evangelist is someone to whom the Holy Spirit has given distinctive empowerment to evangelize. And our journey today will lead us to discover the calling of the evangelist. The commission to evangelize. And the commitment to evangelism. Firstly, the call of the evangelist. Turn with me please to Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 12. You're going to hear these scriptures quite a lot this week. And it reads, now these are the gifts Yeshua gave to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the perfecting and full equipping of the saints that they that says the saints, that they should do the work of ministering. So the saints are there to do the work of ministering toward building up Yeshua's body. Yeshua's body is the church. And it's here revealed in Ephesians 4. We can see the ministerial gift, the ministerial office of the evangelist. It is revealed as part of the fivefold ministry. An evangelistic ministry is distinguished from every other. It is separate. It is distinct. It has its own characteristics. And it is singled out by Yeshua, the risen head, the head of the church himself. It was him who gave this gift. And reading the earlier passages, we know why. The word translated evangelist in the Strong's Concordance, is 2099. You angelistes, which means to herald or to bring good news. It's the same word that we've just read here in Ephesians 4, verse 11, evangelist. And the evangelist is one who is anointed to preach the gospel as a vocation. Do we know what a vocation is? 
a vocation, a calling, a profession. It isn't just something I'm just paid to do, like a career per se. It's something that takes all your life. It's something you're sold out for. It's something that you, you take all your passion and pour it into this. That is what a vocation is. That is what a calling is. It's something that consumes and drives and makes everything your goal. That is what a true vocation is. A true vocation. The evangelists, their messages are designed to lead people to repentance. That word repentance isn't just, oh, I'm feeling bad about what I've done, oh, I'm sorry cry a few tears. Repentance means to be on one track, to turn around completely, completely, and go into another way. That is true repentance. And repentance comes through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The evangelist messages, you know, they lead people to repentance and faith in Yeshua. They are accompanied by miracles that attract the attention of unbelievers and convict them of the truthfulness of the message of the gospel. Evangelists, I want to say, evangelists extend the frontiers of Yahweh's kingdom. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Acts 21 verse 8, the Apostle Paul confirmed that Philip, Philip had the ministerial gift of an evangelist. I'm going to read it. The next day we went to, on to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. You know, Philip was an evangelist and he began, he began his ministry on a food distribution team. You know, in Acts 6, verses 1 to 6, there was a problem. There was the Greek-speaking Jews, or in the scripture it might say Hellenistic, but it just means Greek-speaking Jews. There was widows. And um, there's a bit of uh, favoritism going on. And Yahweh doesn't like favoritism, you know. And these poor Greek-speaking widows were being overlooked in the distribution of food because the, the, the local widows were getting a bit of favoritism you know and it's not good is it you know if somebody gives you a little bit and somebody else and you're hungry and you're dependent on that person for food you've no other food you know it's not good is it you know Yahweh wants everybody to be treated equal and so what the apostle said he said to the congregation you choose you choose seven men now those men had to be full of the Holy Spirit they had to be full of wisdom, and they had to have a good reputation. So they had to be well respected. And this was just to do Yahweh's ministry. You know, it was important. It wasn't anyone, you, there, or anybody. These people had to have a reputation with the people. They had to be respected. I'm saying that their lives had to be right. But full of the Holy Spirit, too. That's so important. It's interesting also to note, when I was studying this, that as Philip, he was serving the people. You know, he was ministering to the people. And as he was doing this faithfully, the gift within him started to grow. You know, and as this gift grew, it later became recognized. And it was recognized as the gift of an evangelist. But, you know, this was about the time the church was being persecuted. And that was after Stephen's martyrdom. You know, Stephen too was one of the seven men. And he had been preaching. He'd been preaching the good news of the kingdom. And he was falsely accused of speaking against the law of Moses. Now, according to Torah, if you speak against the, the law of Moses, that is heresy. And the punishment for heresy is death. It's death. I'm just reading now from Acts 7.57, speaking about the stoning of Stephen. Then, 
They put their hands over their ears and they began to shout. They were shouting. They didn't want to hear what, what Stephen had to say. Do you know, and he remained in dignity with his composure and the Holy Spirit was unctioning him what to say. And he was there, a picture of dignity. And these people, they put their hands over their ears and they began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city, out of the city, and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and they laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Continuing now in Acts 8, verse 1. Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. Now, if somebody was going to be accused of heresy, there had to be witnesses. And the scripture tells us that there was false witnesses who said that Stephen was guilty of heresy. And we've just read here, Saul was one of the witnesses and he agreed with the killing of Stephen. And they threw their coats at his feet. Yes, we'll, we agree with you. You know, and, and they took this man's life. We saw that and he was stoned. And then it goes on to say, a great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers, except the apostles, were scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria. Verse 3, but Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women to throw them into prison. Right, we're all here today, yeah? And we've had worship of Yahweh and the words going forth and we're really getting into this. Could you imagine somebody coming among us, having a look, who looks spiritual, you know, come knocking on your door and dragging you out of your house because you believe in Yeshua? Dragging you out and a crowd coming and screaming at you and throw you into prison for the gospel. Could you imagine that? It doesn't bear thinking about, does it? But you know what? Back then, the greater the persecution, the further the gospel traveled. It was like nobody could extinguish its fire. Drag this one, throw them in prison, or we'll kill Stephen. And the flying popped up here, and it popped up there, and here, and there. And they tried to stamp it out. And they tried to stamp it out. And the harder they tried to stamp it out, the brighter, the brighter, the flame glowed. It wasn't a little pocket here and blow out the candle. It was a flame. It was a fire. It was a fire burning in the hearts and in the minds of those who believe, of those who receive the gospel. This is the true gospel. This is the full gospel. This is the power of the one who is risen. Nobody could extinguish this flame. Hallelujah. You know, the apostles, they stayed in Jerusalem. But Philip started his ministry as an evangelist in the midst of this persecution. We can read about this in Acts 8. Verses 4 to 6. But the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Yeshua wherever they went. Who preached the gospel? No, say that again. Who preached the gospel? The believers. They wherever they were scattered, the believers preached the gospel. Yeah? Philip went to the city of Samaria and he told the people there about Messiah, about Yeshua. And crowds listened intently to Philip because they were eager to hear his message and see the miraculous signs he did. That's the evangelist working there. You can see that. Verse 12. But now the people believed Philip's message of the good news concerning the kingdom of Yahweh and Yeshua. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Verses 14 to 16. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard the people of Samaria had accepted Yeshua, they sent Peter and John there. As soon as they arrived, they prayed for these new believers to receive the Holy Spirit. 
We can see here, can't we, the fivefold gifts working together in harmony. You know, Philip proclaimed the gospel. People were saved. He baptized them. But who, I say who, laid hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit? It was the apostles. It was the apostles. And I believe that today is, is that there is something for us in the scriptures. It was the apostles who laid the hands on these new believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they did, didn't they? They were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, there was great joy in Samaria. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the gifts, the fivefold ministry are there to harmonize together. They all have a part to play, a role to play, but not distinct on their own. They have to be interconnected. The fivefold together. It's like I've got my hand, there's five fingers and a thumb, four fingers and a thumb. You know, it's no good. I can't really take the top off my drink without one, you know, I'd struggle, wouldn't I? And it's the same, the fivefold together, together they minister to the body. The hallmarks of an evangelist, they are bold. They are never afraid to preach the gospel in any situation. They have a spirit of boldness. They proclaim the full gospel with conviction. They bear fruit. People receive salvation. They perform signs and wonders. But most of all, they are dependent upon the Holy Spirit to direct them to the place where Yahweh, where Yahweh wants to cast his net. This brings me to my next point, the commission to evangelize. In Acts chapter 8, uh, verses 26 to 40, we can hear about the account of Philip and the eunuch. And I just want to kind of paraphrase this story to, um, to bring a few things out. So here's Philip the evangelist, uh, and uh, he was at home one day, and the angel of Yahweh came and appeared to him. And he said, go, get up and go. And he wanted him to go on a desert road, which was about 50 miles away, and it led from Jerusalem to Gaza. So um, Philip got up and he went on this road. This road was 50 miles long from Jerusalem to Gaza. Then there was a, 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 an Ethiopian eunuch. Now I'm just telling you a little bit about this Ethiopian eunuch. He was, he was a high official. And there was something in this man that loved Yahweh. He would have been termed as being a God-bearer. And he made a pilgrimage of about 200 miles to go to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. This was this man's desire. It wasn't like he could get on a train or, or, or a plane or whatever. This man would have traveled in a carriage. And he was a high official because he was an official to the Queen of Candance. And, um, and he was there making this pilgrimage. And a lot was invested in this man, in his commitment to serve Yahweh. According to Deuteronomy 23, verse 1, if you read that, there's a list of all the people who cannot enter into the inner courts. They can go in the Gentiles and where the, where the women were. This is in the temple now. But they couldn't have access to the inner court. They was denied access. But in spite of that, this eunuch it had that desire to serve Yahweh, to worship Yahweh, and he went to the temple. <clears throat> During his journey home, he'd invested into the scroll, a book of Isaiah. And he was in his carriage, and he was reading it aloud. And then, this is all amazing, this story, so you have to use your creative thinking of where all the miracles are. So he's on his way home, and he just so happened to be reading the passage in Isaiah, which read, He was led like sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated 
and receive no justice? Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? Now back along, when they used to read, they used to read aloud. And at that moment, Philip was there on this 50-mile strip of road, right? And it just so happened to see this carriage, and the Holy Spirit said to him, go up to the carriage. Now think about this, this 50-mile long road. So he went up, he was obedient, and he went up to the carriage. And there the eunuch was, reading that passage. And so Philip said to him, do you know what you're reading? And the man said, how would I know unless somebody explains it to me? So that was an opportunity. So Philip got in the carriage and he preached Yeshua to this man. He preached Yeshua. He opened up the scriptures and the scroll. And, you know, I was thinking, you know, there's a promise further on in, in Isaiah um, about concerning the eunuchs. Um, because Deuteronomy 23 said, an emasculated man, um, and there's different types of eunuch, but I had a look, and in the Strong's Concordance, this was 2135, and this was this man, you know, and yet there was Philip wanting to be obedient to the Holy Spirit to explain, you know, Samaria, they were half Jews, they were Samaritans, but here was a man, a Gentile eunuch, who didn't have access into the inner courts, Philip went to this man. <coughs> and there was something about the way Philip ministered the scriptures that opened the eyes of this Gentile. And he received salvation. He received salvation. And it just so happened, again, to be going along, and there was some water there. And the eunuch said, I don't know how he knew about baptism, but maybe Philip preached it, I don't know. But he said, is there any reason why I can't be baptised? And Philip said no. So they got off the carriage. And there they were, in this water. And it must have been deep enough, because it said, when he came up out of the water... The Holy Spirit came. The Holy Spirit came. And what happened next was Philip was took off 20 miles to somewhere else. And he carried on preaching the gospel. He didn't say, oh, what happened to him? Oh, gosh, what happened to me? Oh, what was that? Oh, he didn't. He carried on, the scripture said. He carried on preaching the gospel. And there was the eunuch. He got back in his carriage and he went back home. Now, you know, was that an opportunity for the gospel to go through northern Sudan, because I had a look up, and that's where it had gone. It's just at the bottom of Egypt. Did the gospel start from this eunuch to spread out into Africa? You know, earlier we read that the apostles were called to lay hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. Not in this case. The Holy Spirit himself was there at this man's baptism. And it is my conviction that this man was filled with the Holy Spirit. He said he went home rejoicing. You know, salvation brings joy, doesn't it? And a time of rejoicing. You know, but while I was doing this, and I'm going to give you a minute to think about it, this eunuch had been to the temple. He'd been to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh. We read earlier that the apostles were in Jerusalem. Yeah? So why wasn't the eunuch saved in the temple? in Jerusalem by the apostles. They had the gifting to preach and to teach the gospel. They were more than capable, these apostles. So why do you think that he wasn't saved in the temple? Any ideas? Well, I'll just reveal what I think, what I think was happening here. You know, I believe it was because the Holy Spirit specifically made a point of using Philip the evangelist to win this soul. This eunuch, as far as I can see, was one of the first Gentiles to receive salvation and baptism. He was one of the first fruits of the new covenant. You see, the Holy Spirit, he was doing something new. 
The temple was now obsolete. It represented the old covenant where sacrifices, wasn't it, of bulls and goats were made. But you know, this was a dawn of a new era, a new dispensation of truth. No longer were Gentiles and eunuchs excluded of the covenants of promise, but through the blood of Yeshua, we were brought into the new covenant, the renewed covenant. This is the gospel, the gospel, the good news for all. You know, this Gentile, he was, he was excluded from the covenants of promise under the old covenant. He couldn't enter in. And there was this man's desire to worship Yahweh. He wanted to worship Yahweh, but couldn't get in. He was a eunuch. That was it. That's disbarred him. But have a look at chapter 23 of Deuteronomy, and you read the list there of all those people who were excluded. Most of us wouldn't have got in. I certainly wouldn't have got in because we were Gentiles. But here we have the good news of the gospel through the blood of Yeshua, the new covenant. No longer are we strangers and foreigners, but we've entered in. <coughs> this good news is for all. To those in Isaiah 56. To those who keep my Sabbaths, a Sabbath is a feast day of Yahweh. To those who choose that pleases me, keeps the Torah, Yahweh's commandments, the, and those who hold fast to my covenant. This is the full gospel. This isn't a little bit, this is the full gospel. To those who keep my Sabbaths, it's wrote here in Isaiah 56. To those that keep the feasts of Yahweh, those who do what pleases me. We're talking of obedience. We're not, I'll have this bit and I won't have that. We're talking about Torah living. We're talking about keeping the commandments of Yahweh and who hold fast to my covenant. You know, I just want to make a point here. The Holy Spirit blows where he wills. He is not at the command of men. He can work with us, but he can also work without us. To bring about his own divine purposes of Elohim. I just want to think for a moment now to consider Saul. Saul was one of the witnesses of Stephen's stoning, as we read in Acts 8. Saul went everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house to drag in out both men and women. Such was the passion in him. He was innocent. He thought people were speaking heresy. This was the fervor, the passion that he had, that he would do this. And it's quite clear here that the people, the church, are the people. They are the body of Yeshua. And Saul was an enemy of the church. So here we are. Could you imagine him coming amongst us? And this was the same man who dragged people into into prison and he came here today we would be like this wouldn't we hope you don't see me <laughs> you'd be wondering wouldn't you oh gosh this man he just wants to kill us he just wants to destroy the church but who would have thought i'm saying who would have thought that the hand of yahweh was on this man who could have ever thought that the holy spirit would come and yeshua himself would reveal that man but not in the temple he was known to be in the temple, but on a desert road, just like the eunuch, out of the place in the desert road, there Yeshua revealed himself. He said, Saul, why do you persecute me? And that man who was a powerful enemy of the gospel became a powerful ally for the gospel. He was transformed. Something took place in this man when he met Yeshua. And I just want to say, to accomplish the divine will of Yahweh and reap harvest of souls, we first have to align ourselves to the Holy Spirit so his miraculous power and authority can be released. My final point now, the commitment to evangelism. Yeshua had to teach his disciples to be fishers of men. And he had to equip them for service. And when he called them, 
Um, this is the account in Mark 4.21. They were actually mending the nets. And the word mending here in Strong's is 2675. And it's the word translating in Ephesians 4 as equipping. These fishermen, they were equipping their nets by mending them. They were fixing their nets, making them strong, preparing them for service, getting them ready for action. This Greek word is also translated as fitting them out. And J.H. Thayer says it, seem, it means to make one what he ought to be. This word equipping is to make one what he or she ought to be. You know, part of the fivefold ministry, and it is the task of the evangelist, to equip the body. Equipping the saints, though so they should do the work of ministering toward building up the body of Yeshua, the church. They've got to make us what we should be. The evangelists have a responsibility to inspire, to drive, to motivate, and to teach the body how to evangelize and proclaim and present the gospel effectively. In the spirit of the evangelist as proclaimer, is the ability, in them is the ability and power to reach out and be dynamic fishers of men, to connect and pull in people. Their function is to be fruitful and populate the kingdom by the authority of the Holy Spirit. They will inject the message of hope by sharing and living as the salt and life of the earth. The salt and the light of the earth. It's about the evangelist being Yeshua, being that salt and light, living up to what he speaks. He tells you about the gospel. He lives or she lives up to the gospel. You can see that. The power is in them. The authority is given to them. Divine power and authority. You know, there's nothing more invigorating than newly saved believers. It revitalizes the church because salvation brings joy. Someone needs to bring joy to our cities, like Philip the evangelist. You know, the evangelist, the reaper, the gatherer, the preacher, the firelighter, the flame fighters need to be displaying the characteristics and compassion of Yeshua for, not us, for the lost. It's no good having an evangelist here to preach the converted. They need to be out and have that compassion for the lost. They need to be filled daily, ready to mobilize, rally, drum up, support, and help the body become activated. If we see an evangelist inspired by the Holy Spirit, we cannot fail but to get behind them. You know, we've got to sow seeds, haven't we? If we don't sow seeds, we're just going to dry up and wither. There'll be nobody new coming in. You know, I was thinking about water now. If you have water enclosed in an area with no fresh water coming in, what does it become? Stagnant. And it stinks. We need fresh water. You know, Yeshua said, if any man be thirsty, come to me. He would give us living waters. I'm saying, brothers, sisters, be prepared to take round a cup. Take round a cup and give of yourself the living waters. I say, will you answer Yeshua's prayer for more workers? The power and the authority has been released and the harvest is plentiful. Remember, it was Yeshua's prayer. He prayed for more workers. So I'm saying to you, the authority and the power has been released. The gift has been given. We need to get on board with the Holy Spirit. He may just be ready to do something new today. You know, back in the Old Testament, the the temple was there. They were still doing the same things. They hadn't realized the Holy Spirit had moved on. It was a new dispensation. It was a new era. The new covenant had come in. 
We need to get on board with the Holy Spirit. He may be just ready to do something new today. So let us align ourselves to him. And maybe he will choose you to work a miracle through. The challenge. Will you labor and help to reap his end time harvest? We're in the end times. Will you answer Yeshua's prayer and be a worker in his field? Yahweh bless you.